And we are live. Good morning and welcome to this EIT Health Digital Town Hall, coming to you live from our headquarters here in Munich, Germany. To those uh, joining us via Zoom, hi. And to those joining us on Facebook Live also, hello. I'm Seamus Carey, I'm a communications consultant here at EIT Health and I have the privilege um, and the scary job, some might say, of being your moderator for this morning's event. For those that haven't joined one of our digital town halls before, they aim to be a lively and interactive event that allows the EIT Health community to come together and discuss a topic of common interest. And we're delighted that this morning's digital town hall will launch the new EIT Health Think Tank topic. It's a bit of a tongue twister. And that topic is optimizing innovation pathways, future-proofing for success. And what that topic really looks at is what needs to be done to make it easier for innovators and entrepreneurs to bring their health innovation from idea to concept to uh, um, approval and adoption and ultimately to benefit uh, citizens and patients in Europe. We want to make that process as easy and as safe as possible and that's what today's topic is all about but more on that shortly. First, as always, we're joined on the EIT Health couch, which used to be green, but is now a lovely mauve, um, by three very special guests. We have Jan Philip Beck, we have Finn Christensen, and we have Myra Marin. And I'd like each of them to briefly introduce themselves. We'll start with Jan Philip. Yeah, good morning, everyone. Uh, glad to be here. Thank you very much for joining. Uh, I'm Jan Philipp, Jan Philipp Beck. I'm the CEO of EIT Health, and um, yeah, happy to be here again on the couch to um, um, go through uh, the digital town hall uh, with you and hopefully have an exciting discussion. I'm Finn Bertram Christensen, and I'm excited that I was uh, invited to chair this year's uh, think tank. I'm a professor at the uh, European, uh, a Danish uh, university, University of Southern Denmark in health services research and HTA. I'm also an external lecturer at the CBS, the Copenhagen Business School in Copenhagen. I worked in clinics and I worked in epidemiology and uh, health technology assessment outcomes research. Uh, and my main uh, guess uh, work was to develop networks for HTA in Europe. And uh, this gives me a background, I think, to hopefully facilitate this process. Thank you. Hi, and then I'm Myra, and I'm the Think Tank Manager. I oversee all Think Tank activities, and I'm here to give you a brief uh, overview of the process that we will be undertaking today. Well, not today, but this year. <laughs> Wonderful. Now, as I mentioned in my introduction, we want this morning's event to be as lively and interactive as possible, so there are a number of ways for you to get involved. So to get involved, if you're on our Zoom interface, you can ask a question or you can comment in the chat window and our online moderation team will pass that to me and I may be able to mention it on air or if you have a webcam, we might be able to invite you to join us live. Also, we have some voting taking place on three different polls this morning. Um, you can contribute your vote as to whether you agree or disagree with various statements that we provide. You may only vote once per, per statement, so you may either vote straight away once the poll is opened, or you might listen to the discussion and then vote. But I will give you a notice when the poll is about to close so that you can get your votes in. So moving on to our topic for this morning, uh, that is our think tank topic, uh, optimizing innovation pathways, future proofing for success. So if I start with you, Jan Philip, the think tank, this is our second think tank topic. We started last year with the topic of big data. And you might tell me a little bit about the origin of the concept of the think tank and what it aims to do. 
Sure. Well, the think tank we, um, we ran for the first time last year, and essentially it comes from the basic idea to say we want to discuss with the community and the stakeholders around us and barriers to the implementation of good innovation in health. And then um, I think there is, um, we, we learned that, that of course we are strong in our projects, we convene our innovators and entrepreneurs, but then um, to actually bring innovations to, um, to market and to use is a difficult, it's a cumbersome process. There are multiple barriers, so it's important to bring stakeholders together to discuss um, different challenges. And from that, also derive then recommendations on how we can improve our work inside ET Health and our projects, what we can learn, but also to make recommendations and suggestions to the environment, to the policymakers, to regulators um, um, around us. Excellent. Um, as I mentioned last year, the topic was big data. This year, it's optimizing innovation pathways. How did that topic come about and um, why was it chosen? Well, I think we, we have an ongoing, um, ongoing process and, and discuss what are, what are relevant topics out there. We do that in our management board with our community. And we came to this topic because I think everyone understands that, of course, it's always incredibly challenging to bring an idea to, to sort of a product to market to use. But I think in health, we all agree that it's particularly challenging because often um, your user is not necessarily your buyer, the buyer is not necessarily your payer, and of course safety considerations are often paramount. And so this pathway that we will be discussing uh, today is, is of high complexity and we want to sort of just dig deeper into it, we want to understand it better to help entrepreneurs and innovators to navigate this pathway uh, much better, but we also want to see where there may be some flex in the system, where are learnings that we can translate maybe also from the community of innovators and entrepreneurs to those that are shaping the pathway and see how it can maybe be improved. Wonderful. Um, Finn, if I could turn to uh, you and ask a little bit more about why this topic do you think is particularly important and, and, and what your role as, as chair in the think tank will be. Yes, I, I'll be happy to do that. Uh, first of all, a kind of credo. Uh, you know, the Stone Age did not end because lack of stones. It ended because of innovation, because metals were used for better tools and actually also weapons. And so this is just one example of the importance of innovation. And uh, I'm really always very excited about innovation. That said, I've been also a very critical assessor of different kinds of candidates to be innovation. And so it's not all ideas and all new things that are actually innovations. I think eventually when it is taken up in practice and changing practice, that's when you have an in innovation. And um, that's, part of, that's, that's the kind of approach I will have here. So facilitating as best possible this overview that we just heard about that is necessary to get among the many, many stakeholders. Um, it's actually an ecosystem. You need to very early in uh, idea making and in the first phases to think about what are the eventual steps that we need to go through if we really want to see an innovation being taken up. So that's what we are going to address uh, uh, through the think, think tanks and you'll hear more about how uh, the, that is set up. Um, as, a, as a chair I see myself as a facilitator to work with EIT Health to meet its uh, goals uh, also for this process. And I look forward to work hopefully with many of you in the roundtables and in the reporting. Thank you very much. You've mentioned the roundtables and the reporting there. So I'm going to pass to Myra here. Myra, you yeah. are the project manager for the think tank. You might tell us a little bit about what your particular role in this process is and then maybe outline the steps that are going to happen. As we said, we're, we're launching the think tank topic yeah. <laughs> this morning, but it's only the start of the process. So you, you might fill us in on what's going to happen next. Yeah. So the think tank really wants to focus on um, promoting or informing needs-driven solutions. So for this reason, we want to, um, we will be launching the process with a community survey, which I believe we will be sending a link to all our viewers later this week. Um, and with this, we would like to um, capture the experiences of the viewers and the community at large. Um, we will also in parallel be interviewing uh, uh, 
innovators from our portfolio and from outside, so good case examples that would give us the experiences uh, with the barriers and also with uh, good practices that we could also learn from um, to inform the roundtables, which this year will actually happen at all our regions, so it will be a series of seven lo local roundtables. And um, we will also be having a pan-European roundtable. And what this, these roundtables uh, aim to do is to uh, look at the barriers that we found through the interrogation of our profile and these case examples, as well as what the viewers um, put in in the community survey, and see what kind of um, solutions we can think with all the relevant stakeholders at the table. So these roundtables will take place over the summer between July and October. And then after that, we will be uh, releasing a report at our annual summit. And this report will summarize all of the discussions that we had at the local roundtables and the pan-European roundtable as well. And then um, after that, in early 2020, we expect to have a white paper which would inform the political context because a lot of the barriers that we see uh, does, uh, do have to do with the political context. Wonderful. So, as we mentioned, this morning is really only the start of this wonderful think tank process. So, um, Mara will now join our online moderation team. Uh, thanks for being at this part of the discussion. You'll be popping back later. If you want to exit via your right-hand side, that would be Thank wonderful. <laughs> Thank you very much. And now we're going to dig a little deeper into the topic that we are discussing this morning, really to see where those uh, challenges and opportunities are. We've heard a little bit about the think tank uh, topic and we want to explore a little more in detail. So over the last number of weeks, the think tank team, Finn, Miguel Amador, the researcher who's involved in, in this process as well, uh, and Myra have been drawing together as much information as possible that they can find on this really broad uh, topic to get a sense of what the experiences of the community are. And what we found was that very little specific data exists on the challenges. And so this morning, we really want to hear from uh, you, the community, and we have some contributors lined up across Europe that will be uh, joining us. So we're joined by f four of these, as I've said, who will give their first-hand experiences on navigating their particular pathways, um, or in, in the case of one of them, regulating that particular pathway. So I'd like to start by welcoming Bika van Gorp from the Netherlands, who is the co-founder and COO of Fibrecheck. Bika, you might briefly introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about Fibrecheck. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Bika. I'm one of the co-founders of Fibrecheck. Um, at Fibrishek, we developed a software application to detect cardiac arrhythmias, thereby preventing strokes uh, just using a smartphone. Uh, we did pass uh, a lot of the innovation pathway, so we are commercially available today uh, in different business models and have been used by approximately 130,000 people, so there is some adoption at least. Wonderful. Thanks very much. We're looking forward to hearing from you again during this uh, discussion. Next we have Martin Steinberg from Sweden. He is the project leader at Stockholm 3. Martin, you might also introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about Stockholm 3. And I'm loving the art on the wall behind you. Okay, thank you. So uh, Martin Steinberg is my name. We have uh, developed and evaluated and brought to market something called Stockholm 3, which is a, a blood test for uh, prostate cancer. One man in seven in Europe will be diagnosed with prostate cancer in his lifetime. So prostate cancer is a very common disease. The thing is to find it early. And with the Stockholm free test, we roughly find, we double the number of men we find early. And at the same time, we reduce the number of unnecessary treatments by about half. Excellent. Thanks very much for that introduction. And we're looking forward to having you and your input in this morning's discussion as well. Next, I'd love to introduce Lucy O'Keefe from Ireland. Lucy is the co-founder and CEO at Croy Valve. Lucy, you might also like to briefly introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about Croy Valve. Sure, thanks very much. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Lucy O'Keefe. I'm CEO of Croy Valve. 
and we're developing a device to repair one of the valves in your heart without the need for surgery. So in, in heart failure patients, um, the heart stops working correctly and the valves stop working correctly. These patients are typically elderly, over 65, and therefore too ill to go through surgery. Currently they have no treatment option, and so we're developing a device that goes in through the veins and restores the function of the heart. Uh, we're still in a preclinical phase, so we're uh, looking to try and get into clinical trials um, later this year. So still in the development phase of the innovation pathway. Uh, we're a spin out of Trinity College Dublin, where we were supported by, by EIT Health. Excellent. Thanks for that introduction. And last but not least, we have Dr. Falk Emmen, who is joining us from the Netherlands. Falk is the head of the Innovation Task Force at the European Medicines Agency, EMA. Falk, you might like to briefly introduce yourself and tell us about your particular role at EMA. Thank you very much for inviting me and good morning, everybody. So as you mentioned, I'm leading the Innovation Task Force here, which is a multidisciplinary group of um, scientists in terms of quality, safety, and efficacy, but as well as um, lawyers and regulators to um, ensure that we interact with very early innovative developments, mainly in the pharmaceuticals, but as well with technologies and methodologies which are linked to the de development of pharmaceuticals, and to really ensure that these um, early ideas have the best chance or the best support to make it later to the market, as was mentioned earlier during the webinar. So we interact with them, we invite them, we have discussions, informal discussions, and try to guide them through this pathway of innovation, hopefully to a final market success. And that's my main role here, thank you. Excellent, and we're looking forward to getting your input over the course of this morning's discussion as well. So now we're going to open the first uh, interactive element of this morning's event. That's our first poll, if we can pop that up on screen. So poll statement one, there is a well-defined innovation pathway for all types of health innovations to bring a solution from idea to approval to adoption. So quite a general statement. You have the option to vote I agree or I disagree on this poll. We're gonna open that poll now on the Zoom interface. And I, you can either vote now, as I said, or we can give you um, a little bit of a heads up later when we're closing that poll if you want to listen to the discussions uh, first. So, as I mentioned earlier, over the last couple of weeks, uh, Miguel Amador, part of our think tank team, um, has put together a generic pathway summarizing many of the steps required to take an idea from innovation to, uh, sorry, take an innovation from idea to approval to adoption. And we're aware that this isn't really a linear process and it can greatly differ from case to case. But that uh, generic pathway will hopefully add some structure to our discussion today. I'm going to pop that up on screen now. So Finn, um, I'd love to start with you here. Uh, we have a very interesting and colourful page in front of you. You might chat us through this pathway in general terms. What are the, what are the phases, what are the steps and what does this pathway show? Yeah, it is, it's really an attempt to depict what we already talked about in general terms. So it, it starts with ideation, uh, identifying a need and having an idea uh, how to meet that need. That could be what we call unmet clinical need, which is uh, a concept that is growing and growing in discussions about pharmaceuticals. And by the way, in referring to Falk's input, uh, it's uh, also a, important to note that, that we are in, indeed in an ecosystem where also the development of pharmaceuticals is merging with other kinds of technology developments and could not uh, anymore be seen as separate. That is also uh, intensified by the introduction of all the digital health solutions. So from idea basically to uptake and eventually uh, um, disappearance uh, becoming obsolete because there is a better solution that has been developed. That again is underlining that this is indeed uh, uh, not a linear but um, rather a spiral process of moving forward and um, it is not as well you can describe it as staged but 
actually activities are going on and should be going on with a view to later stages. And this is a key, I think, uh, thing that I will make sure we cover carefully. How do you best clarify at early stages the viability of your idea all the way into implementation in clinical practice. That is even beyond if there is an issue of regulation, uh, there definitely will be uh, an issue of informing any payer that uh, needs to say yes and be ready to, to pay for an innovation. But then the, the last part is actually the uptake. You see examples in several countries including UK, that you have a body that gives green light and then it's up to the healthcare system to actually do the implementation. That calls maybe for funding that is not immediately available. So budget impact, etc., are challenges. So uh, coming back to, to uh, this description, you could say it has a part that leads up to any kind of uh, approval to be able to go into practice or go into market. And then there are the things about decision making on uptake, which is paying, but also clinical uptake. And we're going to cover both. I think that's what I would say at opening. Very good. And then you mentioned there a m merging of lots of what used to be distinct categories of medical technology, be that a, a medical device, a digital app, an IVD. Um, is that pathway the same for all of these? And are we looking at any particular category in the think tank, or are we generally looking across them all? Well, I think uh, based on uh, a very good work done by Miguel, we, Miguel we, have, we have a good starting point. It led to this description, but there's actually a literature uh, review behind. And, uh, and the challenge definitely is, uh, what about all these uh, e-health, m-health, uh, uh, digital health, uh, new technologies, these mergers again mm -hmm. of something concrete, tangible, and uh, the use of, uh, of digital solutions. Uh, we're going to cover that, and that is an example of another pathway, but basically still from idea, from problem to implementation. Excellent, thank you for that. I'm going to invite um, Falk to join us here. If I can remind people, Falk is the head of Innovation Task Force at um, EMA. Looking at this generic pathway, uh, Falk, I'd like to ask, you know, what role does EMA currently have and where does it sit on this, on this uh, pathway? Thank you very much. So first, I'd like to congratulate to the comments that have been made. Indeed, we see more and more blur between the different product lines. So if you wish so, pharmaceuticals are not clear-cut pharmaceuticals anymore. They are borderline products, they are combined products, so they are devices, food cosmetics. So it's very difficult to distangle these maybe historically easy to distinguish products now into different pathways. And therefore, I really like your proposed innovation pathway. However, I would maybe multiply it by four on four different lines in terms of medicines, devices, food and cosmetics. And then again, unfortunately, put into different um, time points as you did here, where different agencies or different regulation gets involved in terms of HTAs, in terms of scientific input, in terms of legislation, who's responsible for this and so on. So um, this I um, just wanted to, to highlight. Now. Um, Coming to this general pathway, I think this is indeed a very good starting point. There are some specific, of course, for pharmaceuticals or devices or other products. And these specifics um, need to be very well considered as early as possible. So after 10 years of um, doing this job, looking at lots of developments, I think there are two main messages I'd like to convey here. One thing is think as early as possible about what might come later. And I think the marketplace has been mentioned. You can have the best product the most scientifically um, sophisticated development, but if you don't have a place on the market at the, end, at the end, including being reimbursed, it will never make it and it stays as a great idea. And in order to achieve this, again, it's very important to look at regulation or to look at what kind of opportunities or hurdles or challenges might lie ahead. And therefore, we try to offer here from the European medicines perspective, a very early dialogue um, with us or whoever is your responsible body 
in order to ensure that you think about these hurdles or opportunities at a very, very early stage. Thanks, Falk. And I suppose two points uh, coming up from what you've mentioned there. The first is, yes, um, we're totally aware here at AIT Health of the complexity of those pathway uh, types. And the plan is, as we uh, move forward in this think tank, to really begin to map out that pathway by uh, innovation type. And the second point uh, you've mentioned is the idea of, you know, always being a step ahead. So you might only be at one particular point in, in the pathway, but you need to be thinking about what's required later on and ensuring that you're, you're developing the information, the insight, the input from others at that point. And that's something that I'd like to ask some of our contributors, our entrepreneurs and our innovators who are joining us. So if I could turn to Lucy first um, and asking you the hard questions. Um, Looking at that pathway and where you are in your process at the moment, do you think you were f familiar with the pathway and the steps needed to be taken before you could reach market when you started work on your innovation type? And what areas generally have you found the most challenging so far? Sure. So, yeah, I suppose I was lucky enough in terms of my background is has always been in, in developing medical devices. Um, and I would have previously worked in a multinational developing cardiovascular medical devices and actually one of which was a heart valve. So I, I had lots of good experience in terms of in terms of the innovation pathway and had brought uh, a number of other products through various stages in that. Obviously, medical device pathways are, are very long, so you don't always get to see, see all aspects. So I, I would say I had a, had a good understanding Obviously, when um, it's a startup and, and you're having to, 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 to do everything, you probably need a more in-depth understanding of all aspects than would be the case in a multinational. Um, I would say probably in terms of the development and, and market entering the market phases, I, I probably very detailed experience. I, I would say probably in the reimbursement, um, I hadn't, hadn't, hadn't fully lived that before. Um, and, and I suppose one of the interesting things that I suppose you, you've all mentioned already is the need to kind of really understand the full pathway right from the start. And certainly when you're a startup and you're, you're fundraising and there's significant funding required, and um, that's something that your investors expect as well. So having to be able to kind of talk about reimbursement codes before you've, you know, you, you've um, really finalized your, your design is, is, is one of the things that, 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 that's expected. So certainly um, there, there's more in-depth understanding of some elements that I've had to, we've had to work through um, to, to make sure that we, we have, a, I suppose, a, a detailed plan for, for taking the device through, through all aspects. That makes perfect sense. And I guess it's like any, uh, any innovation or any um, development in any business, it's, it's making sure there is a market there at the end. So it, it's great to be developing new technology and new ways of doing things. But is there that market there at the end that, that will either buy it or will, will reimburse it? Thanks very much for those uh, comments. If, if I could turn to Bika, Next, uh, Bika from Fibrocheck. Um, was this the same for you? Did you have an understanding of, of the pathway at the start? Uh, what Lisa mentioned there was it's easier if you're part of a, a multinational that has done this several times with several different products. Um, I'm guessing as, as an entrepreneur in a, a startup, it, it must be tougher. Um, yeah, yes, actually, it, it, it might in, indeed be, be as, as you need to look everything up um, yourself. So, so basically, I could say that we were aware of uh, most of the steps of the of the general uh, innovation pathway, but not always into depth. So, if you look to the story of uh, of Fibrishek, uh, it started maybe a little bit atypical. So, um, we are actually uh, started from a master thesis where uh, the question was raised from a cardiology department in a Belgian hospital: how smartphones uh, could help in the timely detection of cardiac arrhythmias. So for us, the ID and the clinical need uh, was there from the beginning, as well as the access to the clinical data, which is very important in the development process. Um, what was for us, without any doubt, the most challenging was getting the certification as a medical device um, and understanding that process, um, as well as adoption. With respect to the certification of a medical device, it was really cumbersome as um, in 2016, at least the, the, the legislation was really not made for uh, software applications like ours in the preventive space. So we really needed to interpret the regulation, which is quite hard as a startup. You don't have all the uh, experts on board, but on the other hand, it's difficult to raise capital before being certified as a medical device. So it's a bit a circle. 
Um, and then the second thing we completely underestimated was the impact the medical device regulation has on the development. So making software is completely different than making medical software. And uh, this was uh, clearly underestimated on our side with respect to timing and, uh, and budget. Um, and the second element is, of course, linked to um, adoption. It's, um, it's quite difficult to get reimbursement, uh, certainly in a preventive area like ours. And um, here there is also a complete lacking of, uh, of standardization. Thanks very much for those comments. That's excellent. And we'll, we'll return to some of those topics as we dig a little deeper in over the next uh, 30 minutes. So Martin, turning to you, um, what's your experience in this area? And, and did you have knowledge of, uh, of the steps you needed to take beforehand? Or is this something that you've been figuring out as you, uh, as you go along? Uh, well, we started to develop the Stockholm 3 test in 2011, and if you ask me or any of the other founders then, did we, didn't, did we know about these steps in the innovation pathway? The answer would be no, absolutely not. And in a way, I would, I would you know, had we known about all the challenges laying ahead of us, we might not even have started this journey of developing the Stockholm 3 test. So, you know, sometimes it can actually be good to be a little bit naive. Having said that, we have learned a lot. And now we have a big team working on this and we have a good knowledge about, I would say, most of these steps. And, and you can see that we're coming out with our second product, which is called OncoWatch Image, which is basically that we have a little bit further downstream in the prostate cancer diagnostic chain when you, when you look at the prostate cancer biopsies. We have, we used AI and deep learning and all that kind of stuff to teach the computer to evaluate prostate cancer biopsies. And we are able, since we know so much more now, to accelerate that process tremendously. So of course it's of great value to have a lot of knowledge of the different steps here. That's great, thanks for that, that input. So um, we're gonna close the vote now. So if anyone hasn't uh, submitted their, vote yet, please do so now. And I'm going to turn to Jan Philip and ask if you can guess what you think the, the poll results are, are, are gonna show. Do you think that the EIT Health community thinks that there is a clear pathway for innovation or will they, will they say that actually no, it's all a little complicated and it's quite confusing? Well, my, my guess would be that the, that the turnout will be that it is indeed um, complicated and it's not, um, it's not so clear. And I guess that what we have heard from Martin, from Lucy and Bike is that there, I guess that there is an understanding of um, that there is, of course, a process and there are steps, but then the devil is indeed in the details. Um, and I think um, what became very clear from, from what has been said is that I think there is a tremendous need to have access to experience because they think there are messy parts. There's some things that are clearly defined, but in some cases you really, um, you really need to rely probably on people that have done that before, um, right? And so next to engaging, of course, with, with patients, with users and, and, and so on, you, you need to have access to, to, to mentors, I guess, that, that, can, that can help you. And I think this is also something that I believe we, um, we should reinforce in, uh, in EIT Health to, to support um, startups, projects, uh, with that kind of access to expertise. And we, we started to do that, but it gives me some um, reassurance. But yeah, let's look at the results. Maybe I'm still off. Excellent. Let's pop up the results of our survey of that poll statement number one. So yes, uh, only 12% agree that there is a well-defined innovation pathway for all types of health innovations with 88% disagreeing. So I guess that proves that this is the right topic for our think tank. It is something that people are interested in and something that needs to be uh, looked at. Um, Finn, do those results surprise you? Not really. Uh, I, th I think it's good. I mean, we could say job job done if it had said 100% agree, <laughs> yeah. but now let's go into it. And I, and I like this issue of uh, optimism, or it was called naivety, a degree of naivety, 
uh, but, but act by Martin. But actually, I mean, there needs to be an optimism that should be nurtured with realism all the way. Because it's also optimistic, in a way, to say that if this is not viable, it should be stopped at uh, the right time. We should not spend time and energy and resources if it is not really viable. And getting to the point of understanding uh, if it is viable, that, that is the point that we should do all we can to, to help clarify. That makes perfect sense. Okay, so we're going to move into looking at the pathway in two different sections. If we can pop up on screen the first focus area that we're going to talk about, that is the red highlighted area on the pathway. So the first area we're going to look at is the area involving ideation, development and a market entry. So Finn, if I can turn to you and say, you know, this is quite a, a broad topic, even those, those three ideas on their own are very big, we could take one of them and probably speak for the next uh, seven days on it. But looking at it generally, what do you think are the emerging challenges or the emerging issues in this uh, part of the pathway? Yeah, first of all, I think it is, a, it is a emerging clearly that we need to do something about the issue of digital health. How does it fit into uh, descriptions of a pathway? Uh, how are we making sure that links are made at the right time so that um, innovators in that area are also helped not going into dead ends or something similar? So that, that's uh, one observation. Okay. I think much of the other things in, in terms of need from clinical research, etc., are clear. Getting into contact with, with the clinicians and doing clinical studies is uh, identified by Miguel's uh, work as an issue. Um, you may sit in a lab or you may even sit at a university department not directly linked up to health, and then how do you get in contact with the clinical world uh, and move forward? That's an issue. And is access to capital for small SMEs who want to develop and, and conduct clinical trials, is that an issue? Yeah, I'm sure it is. And I mean, getting co convincing information to a potential uh, venture capital is linked also to the things that you would need anyway later on in the process. So again, you should think about this as an ecosystem. And the example that Falk brought up with early scientific advice, early dialogue, that was also developed with the HTAs when I led the European network for HTA from 11 onwards. And now there is a joint early scientific advice between the regulators and, and the HTA institutions. And that's just a small patch on this, but it is this willingness to go into dialogues about what is uh, needed to move ahead through any hurdles that are um, to expect. Thanks for that. We're going to open poll statement number two now, if we can pop that up on screen. This is one of the ideas that, that Finn hasn't mentioned here, but, but kind of uh, comes up in this section of the, of the pathway. Um, we need a more joined up Europe-wide approach to standardize pathways and requirements for approval and adoption of innovation. So at the moment, we have various national bodies, we have various different systems. Uh, do we need a more joined up European-wide approach? That poll is now open. You can vote now, or you can listen again to the commentary that we're going to have and, and then decide how you will vote. So I'm going to start with uh, Bika here. Um, would you agree with, with Finn's views on the challenges in this area? Is standardization of, of regulation an issue? And what's been your experience? Um. So in, um, in in general, absolutely, I, I, I do agree with uh, with the statements, and, and, and standardization should absolutely help. If you if you look specifically to to, to three topics in in this first phase, um, so of course clinical data is is absolutely um, necessary and and it, for your further development process. 
Here specifically, we were in the cellar of a hospital to be close to the patients, to be able to get the clinical data as fast as, as, as possibly uh, we, uh, we could get it. Um, and this is, of course, uh, very, very in important. Also, have the experience on board. So one of our founders was an expert in setting up clinical uh, trials and, and gathering data. Um, with respect to the early user input, I also absolutely agree, but I do need to see here say that we have quite some complexities. So it was absolutely not difficult to get people enthusiastic about our ID to get input uh, from, uh, from different clinicians. But um, we saw that once developed and implemented, it's, it's still st stuck basically on the, on the reimbursement setting. So it is fairly difficult to, to, to get uh, user inputs and, and value them correctly also towards the uh, adoption pathways. Um, we then the third element with respect to regulatory, of course, I mean, that's, that's, that's clearly a fact. I mean, there is a, a European uh, Medical Diverse Directive, uh, which is difficult sometimes for digital health applications to find um, the way. But that said, uh, once you have your certification, I mean, it's still not done. It, it doesn't mean you can start in, in, each, uh, in each country. There is still um, specific legislation in, uh, in each country, sometimes just administrative legislation, sometimes with respect to, to data storage, which makes it um, very, very cumbersome and difficult to, to truly scale. Um, and also it's difficult to find the specific legislations for each country. I mean, I never found a consolidated sheet that told me what I should do in, in, in which country. Um, so yes, we would be a big fan of standardization. Thanks very much for that input. If I go to Martin uh, Steinberg from Stockholm 3. Martin, have you found the same issues that we, as we've raised here? Was access to clinical trials an issue for you? First, yeah, well, uh, not really. I mean, we decided, well, I mean, there are always this issue about if you want to launch something, you need to start with, is there really a user interest? Will they be able to pay? Are they going to be interested in paying and so on and so forth? So, and, and will you be able to attract, is this attractive enough for, for, big, for big companies also to be involved? Um, and, and at the same time, you have the problem with funding uh, an early uh, venture. So what we decided already from the beginning was to, um, uh, to work very closely with, with healthcare providers, in our case, the Stockholm County Council, who is also a payer, and with, uh, with a large industry company, Thermo Fisher. So, and that has been very, very beneficial because by working with the Stockholm County Council, first of all, they said, yes, this is very interesting. If you have this product, we are probably going to be able to pay for it. Then what they also did was to give us access to patients. And in the end, they paid for, for the study. So we got a lot of financing. Uh, if you add what we got in cash and in, in kind, it's probably about 30 million euros. It's, it's costly to run big trials. We did a trial with 60,000 men. Now, the other thing we did was, okay, so should we develop our technology platform ourselves and find money for that? Or should we do that with a partner? And we decided to do that with Thermo Fisher. And that has also been very good because, first of all, they had the technology. They only needed to tweak. Now, they only needed to tweak it. It has probably cost them about 10 million euros and it's taken a couple of years, but it's still, you know, finance wise, you know, we couldn't have done it. And, and we have, they have, that has accelerated the process too. So I think from us, our standpoint, the key has been to work between uh, entrepreneurs, big pharma, academia and care providers. Thanks for that. So I guess what you're saying there is, you know, really being uh, cognizant of what happens at the end in terms of adoption and making sure that you have those partners built in along the way to ensure that when you have it finally developed, that there is a market there ready for it. So that's great. Yeah, both that and, and the case that you actually need financing during the way. I mean, you, it's, it can be very costly. Martin, so if I turn to uh, Jan Philip here, um, one of the issues that we have heard about there and the poll 
statement that's up is the idea of um, standardization of, of uh, regulation. Do you think this is an issue and what's EIT Health's view on it? Yeah, so I think maybe taking a little bit of a, of, a, of, a, of a market perspective here, I think it's kind of logical and has, it has driven a lot of um, European legislation from an internal market perspective. For example, say, well, of course it makes sense if you want to create... Um, is, uh, if you want to create a strong single market, also from a competition, a global competition point of view, of course it makes sense to push forward on, on, on standardization or a degree of harmonization of legislation. It certainly makes sense, and I think it also resonates with what, what, what has been said here. Um, of course, um, and, and maybe to add to that, I think it might, something like this can of course also help smaller member states. Let's not forget that in, in the EU um, we have very, very um, different, different capabilities maybe, and I think also smaller, you need capacity to put things like this in place, so smaller countries might even benefit from something like that. But of course this is a very um, political um, question um, um, in the end, and I think um, it, it, it might not be sort of so close um, at hand to get there. So I think uh, what is key is that indeed, as Finn said, uh, we resolve issues around assessing digital um, technologies, and we probably need to, need to work further to towards a better alignment of the different national assessment bodies, uh, try to also eliminate maybe things what Bika mentioned, like sort of hiccups in administrative implementation, in regulation implementation. So I think maybe there are things that can be done even if we cannot achieve a full uh, standardization or harmonization um, in the near future. Okay, so we want to get there, but it's not going to be a straightforward process is what you're saying, I guess. A bit more, also my own opinion, maybe than um, than an official EIT health <laughs> yeah. um, um, statement. But uh, I think I think from a from a market perspective, indeed, it, it, it certainly does make sense. Okay. Yes. And then, um, if I can bring Falk in here from EMA, speaking of of personal opinions and not speaking on behalf of an organisation, uh, we'd love to get your view on this um, without pre presupposing a, an official EMA position on this. Would you like to see more standardization of regulation? And do you think we will eventually get there? So thank you very much. It's a, it's a very difficult and complex question. Um, I feel a bit like in Dragon's Den with so many startups here, but it's it's very refreshing um, conversation. So I think society via the arm of regulators maybe have to be enablers for innovation, for new products reaching the market economically um, as well as um, for the patient's perspective. But as well, you have to gatekeep um, certain certain safety issues. And um, there's a very, very thin line in terms of regulation, um, tipping one side or the other. You can over-regulate things, you can prevent innovation. And I like very much um, what Martin stated before, that um, sometimes a bit of naivety helps you to put forward. Because if you see the mountain being too high, maybe you will never go that way. Um, Nevertheless, um, most um, of the of the especially small um, developers or academic spin-offs and so on, they need clarity and certainty. I think at least to a certain extent on a very early stage. So there, there are two criteria I think which are of utmost importance. One thing is we're talking about really different areas here which are now merging, i.e., pharmaceuticals, devices, food, and cosmetics, and where pharmaceuticals are currently quite very centralized um, regulated devices are not at all so and um, there are new regulations popping up which tend to go in this direction but I think for me this multi-layered approach with these more complex products um, digital therapeutics and so on um, makes uh, makes the whole thing really more challenging and the next criteria I'd like to highlight is that there are different stakeholders and you treat indeed spin-offs from um, universities or small medium-sized enterprises completely different than um, pharma giants with um, multi-trillion um, dollar uh, turnovers. So there I think we have to really ensure that we provide the right support and the right regulation for the right developers, enabling the ideas to be fruitful, but as well giving the right certainty um, to allow economic growth. So, come, sorry, coming to my personal opinion, a little bit more centralized regulation, it's very personal now, in terms of devices, I think would be beneficial. Thank you. That's great. Thanks for that, and thanks for being honest in your opinion. That's great to hear. Um, Lucy, if I can bring you in here, in our, our preparations for this morning's event, you had some thoughts around the new uh, MDR 
the medical device regulation. Can you briefly tell us what's happening there and what your, your thoughts on it are? Sure, yeah. So just, just to make sure everyone's on the same page, there's a, there's a new medical device regulation coming in. Um, <clears throat> it's brought into force uh, in May next year, so it's kind of 12 months away from brought it, being brought into force. And, and its intent is probably, you know, very valuable in terms of improving some of quality issues that we're seeing with medical devices in Europe. Um, and it's changing kind of some of the requirements around clinical evaluation, device classification, notified bodies. Um, and, and post-market surveillance. So I think the overall intent of it, um, I don't think there's any issues with, uh, and probably aligned to what, what some people are saying in terms of helping make sure there's more standardization. The challenge comes in actually with the implementation. So while maybe the intent of it was, uh, was worthwhile, I think there's challenges around the implementation. So just to, to maybe highlight what, the, what that is. Um, so the regulation is 12 months away from being brought into force. Uh, currently there's 58 notified bodies in Europe. Uh, there is one certified to the new uh, standard, so effectively there's a bandwidth problem. There's tens of thousands of medical devices that need to be recertified to the new uh, regulation, and there's no capacity now with notified bodies. Um, and what that then means for, for the likes of ourselves, who are kind of an early stage startup, is it brings a lot of uncertainty in terms of planning the journey in Europe. So because there is now effectively no one to have discussions with around the requirements by the point we'll need, need to um, go through the regulation process in Europe, uh, a lot of startups and a lot of innovation are now turning to the US. Investors are kind of highlighting that they would now see um, European startups as, as less competitive or less attractive than US startups because the journey in Europe is becoming more challenging. Um, and also probably even um, um, investors are, are highlighting that medical device startups versus the likes, likes of biotech are also less attractive because of this uncertainty. So um, kind of no more than what we've been, been discussing today, planning the full journey, um, of the innovation pathway is very important and this change, changing regulation is bringing in a lot of uncertainty in Europe that makes it difficult to plan uh, and therefore uh, kind of driving actually innovation out, out of Europe which is I think is a real shame and will mean that some of these devices take longer to get to patients in Europe. Thanks very much for that Lucy. Jan Philip, is there any, any IT health view on this? Is there anything being done internally looking at this topic? Um, well Lucy, thank you so much for sharing this. I think um, well, I think the, the, the think tank should also provide a good opportunity um, to, to discuss those matters and maybe raise that because I think a number um, of those stakeholders will also be um, at the table. And I think it's um, um, what becomes very clear is that, 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 that good regulation and its implementation is, is, is important to ensure, of course, patient safety, but also the accessibility um, of new innovations. And finally, um, um, of course, uh, strengthen our competitiveness in Europe, and I think it would be horrible to hear um, if many startups or um, innovators would turn would turn to the U.S. because regulation might be. Um, maybe not better, but maybe better or more effectively implemented. And I think that's, that's, very, that's very dangerous. So um, to answer your question, I think this, it's, it's precisely something that we should also raise uh, during the think tank. We will have round tables in all the jurisdictions where we have collocation centers in Europe. That's a lot of centers of excellence um, um, in, around the continent. Um, so, so let's do that. Let's, let's, let's raise that um, matter and... Uh, and um, yeah, also discuss that the notified bodies, as Lucy mentioned, um, well, they need to be need to get get ready to apply um, new regulation. Otherwise, we will um, run the risk of not um, of not having the proper processes in place to support innovation adoption. Thanks for that. We're going to open up the poll results now for the second poll statement. Um, we're going to pop those on screen. So. We need a more joined up Europe-wide approach to standardized pathways and requirements for approval and adoption of innovation. Strikingly, 95% of those uh, voting agree with that, that uh, statement. So we have a lot of work to do in that area, but there is a, a destination to reach. I'm now gonna open up poll number three at the same time, which links quite nicely to the topic we've just been discussing about innovation leaving Europe and, and perhaps being more focused in, in the US. This is statement number three. It is generally easier to get an innovative product solution approved and adopted in the US rather than in Europe. The poll is open now. And with that, we have about five minutes left. We're gonna move on to our second part of the 
pathway, that's the adoption phase, and that links quite nicely with this topic. So one of the, the things we mentioned earlier, uh, Finn, was you know it's great to get approval of a product, but just because it's been approved doesn't mean it's going to be used or adopted anywhere. And I think some of the statistics coming out of Miguel's research say that 70% of the products and solutions that work through approval, 70% um, don't get adopted. So uh, what are the challenges on this phase of the um, pathway? And if we could pop that up on screen, that would be great. I think this, this is really where the, the different uh, roundtables are going to be very important because th there's a lot of uh, context that, that is not European, not global, but national or maybe even hospital. And so we, we will be relying on a way of getting this information into the process through the, the roundtables. Um, and um, of course there are possibilities of standardization, where standardization is appropriate, but as also mentioned, a lot of it is about implementation through legislation, negotiated agreements, etc. And maybe here a concept of harmonization would be more appropriate. But uh, we listened to this, and I think also it was very important to hear the issue, or current issue, of concerns about certainty, uh, reducing uncertainty, and right now the uncertainty about the uh, implementation of the new legislation on uh, medical devices and in vitro uh, diagnostics. Uh, this is uh, something that we need to take up uh, as we move through this year, I think EIT Health in itself has a big role here to do what it can to clarify this and also show ways uh, to, to move forward. Um, I think that's what I would put in here. Thanks for that. If I could uh, invite Bika to join the conversation here. You might tell us where you are at this uh, phase of the pathway, and my understanding is uh, you've been successful in both getting your product approved in, in the US as well as in Europe, so you might talk about the, the differences there. Okay, so if you say like, the question also like, is it easier to get in the United States? Um, I, I, I tend not to agree, it's, it's, it's quite difficult. We indeed got our um, MDA uh, successfully. Um, and here, uh, what I liked about the FDA is for sure the fact that it's more effectively implemented. Um, so when you file, you immediately know when you will get feedback, when the questions will uh, be raised, how many times you have to answer um, the questions, etc. Um, I agree with Lucy, it's uh, different uh, from, a, from a European angle. So just to give you an idea, when we started uh, in 2016, our uh, certification process for Europe. We needed to request a quote to a notified body. Um, it took four months before getting an answer. It took seven months before a first audit could take place. So, I mean, it, it's, it's a tremendous time um, for, an, uh, for an early startup. With respect to the pure regulatory uh, perspectives uh, from US and um, Europe, uh, the United States is for sure putting more um, attention to its scientific evidence. So it were clear all experts in our specific field on the table and we needed to provide them with a tremendous amount of, uh, of data. And furthermore, there was also more attention to its cybersecurity as well as to, uh, to usability studies. Um, what was also surprising uh, to me um, is that we did not succeed in finding a good consultant to help us through our FDA regulation processes. So as mentioned also before, it's extremely important to have experts in the field that truly did it. And um, for us, it was very hard to find. So we need to do it completely internally. And of course, this will have slowed down the timing uh, a little bit. Thanks very much for that, Bika. Um, I'm conscious of time. We've almost just run out of time. I'd love to go back to Lucy and Martin and get their experiences there. But unfortunately, we just don't have time for that. So I'd like to pop up um, the Results of poll statement three, if that's possible. That was our statement on the, is it easier in the US compared to Europe? If we have those results, that would be great. Um, 
while we're getting those, I might go to Jan Philip and just ask for your thoughts here. Maybe also trying to trying to provide some reflection on um, and what has been said, and also how we translate that in in in, in how we go forward in the think tank. Um, what I learned now from what you have said is that I think we should be in our discussions in the round table be extremely, we should be very practical. I think we should also look at, at case studies and we should very much look not only at the big picture on how regulation as such will evolve, but also on how it is actually being, being implemented. And there might be a lot of, um, well, there might even be cultural issues, but there might be a lot of administrative provisions and how things are done. And if, if it's the case that um, we are, um, that we can learn from other regions in the world on, on how this is done better, um, we urgently need to, need to do so. Um, and of course, I think we, um, we should also never forget, of course, that even the FDA will have a difficult and a challenging process, but then, of course, it means um, a much wider and larger market uh, that is then accessible. So again, coming back to the question on how we deal with this in Europe, uh, we need to find a way um, um, to, to link up these processes in Europe um, better to actually uh, make this one uh, common, common region. I think that's absolutely of paramount importance. Great, we're gonna pop those uh, results of poll statement three up on our screen. So a little bit more balanced this time. So 65% agree that it's easier to get their innovative product or solution approved and adopted in the US rather than in Europe, while 35% disagree. And this is, I suppose, just one of the issues we're gonna be discussing in that adoption phase over the next couple of weeks with our think tank. Um, Myra has rejoined us back on the couch. As we wrap up, um, Myra, what's happening next in the think tank? So, people. yeah, so as you can see, there's a lot uh, around the discussion. So we'll continue that with the community, with the community survey, which will be sent to the EIT health community by uh, Jan Philip in his CEO uh, weekly newsletter. And also to all our Zoom viewers that were registered, they will also receive the link through uh, email. So you'll be receiving that. And then um, in parallel, we will be uh, capturing more of the experiences of innovators through the interviews that we'll be having um, with good case examples of those that have gone or are going through the pathway. Um, this is before the roundtables that we'll be having in summer. Wonderful. Uh, Finn, a closing thought. Has there been anything surprising that you've heard today? Is it in line with what you're thinking about the topic? Well, yeah, I, I think, uh, I mean, I'm very practically thinking now about the, the roundtables that it's important to start recruiting now not only the innovators, but actually also the potential and end users, uh, the regulators and uh, those that are in the process of, of health technology assessment for the payers. Even voices of payers would be interesting, mm -hmm. but particularly also uh, have the voices of clinical management in hospitals. Excellent, and the final word to you, JP. Well, um, let's get to work. I think we've, um, um, we, we have a lot of challenging tasks here at hand. Um, I, I would really think we, 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 should, we should try to, to, to focus our work around some clear, good case studies. I think what Martin, um, Beek, and Lucy have provided has been extremely valuable, and I think that will make our work tangible, especially if we have so many stakeholders involved. But um, yeah, I'm excited about it. I'm, I'm, I'm very thankful for all the, the voices we've heard uh, during this, and I think it will help us um, focusing uh, our task as we are going forward. And hopefully we could give, give everyone a good introduction on what we are up to. Thank you very much. So all that's left to be said from us here at EIT Health Headquarters in Munich is thank you to our guests on the sofa. Thank you to those who joined us online. That's to Lucy, Falk, Martin, and Bika. And thank you to all of, uh, to all of you that joined, uh, contributed via Zoom and via Facebook from all of us here in EIT Health Headquarters. Thank you and goodbye.